I'm Martha Zavala, president of the League of Women Voters, Pasadena area, and I'm delighted to welcome you to League at Night, the path to 100% renewable energy, opportunities and obstacles. Happy Earth Day to all of you. This is a great way for us to kick off the weekend. Tonight, we look for answers. How do we stop damaging our environment? And what role can cities play in arresting the destruction of our habitat? This is personal. We're not just talking about saving the condors. We're talking about us and our children and their children. A few people realize that human-induced climate Recording change in progress. A in the extreme drought Syria experienced prior to its civil war. And this drought in turn led to large scale migration. And this migration in turn worsened the socioeconomic stresses at the root of Syria's descent into war. Perhaps that's not something we're gonna have to face here, but we're certainly gonna continue to face a lot of disruptions. We already know what a competition over resources and hubris can do to disrupt entire populations. We're seeing it now. We do not need to see more before we act. By now, you know climate change is of the utmost importance to the League of Women Voters at the national, state, and local levels. The League is a nonpartisan national organization whose mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. And we are committed to advocating for causes that have the power to positively, positively transform lives. Tonight, we take up the cause of converting the power sources used by our cities and us. And we have very knowledgeable speakers to tell us what their cities are doing to stop the damage to our climate. But first we'll start with the program details. The presenters, the speakers will talk about 15 minutes each. The presentations will, will then be followed by an interactive Q&A session. And I encourage you all to participate by entering questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Please don't use chat. The events team uses this function to communicate with each other and us. Please contribute to our evening by asking questions. Be aware that we may need to edit your questions for brevity or to eliminate duplicates. After the main program, please stay tuned as we offer you an opportunity to take action. We have a couple of officials in attendance to show their commitment to taking climate action. And if I'm um, not unaware that you're there, perhaps you can uh, send me um, a message in the Q&A. And we have Diana um, Mahmoud, South Pasadena City Council and former mayor of South Pasadena. She is also chair of the board of the Clean Power Alliance, a community choice aggregator nonprofit that competes with South Cal, Southern California Edison and offers 100% renewable energy and is now the default provider for the unincorporated parts of LA County, which includes our very own Altadena. Uh, Daniel Rossman, member of the Pasadena Environmental Advisory Commission is also here. So thank you for your presence. We're very excited about the opportunity to partner with you uh, to advance progress on this issue. Uh, just to let you know, Pasadena Me Media is live broadcasting the event on public access TV and a video will be posted on the league's YouTube channel in the next couple of days. And now I'm very pleased to turn it over to our moderator for the evening, Cynthia Kennedy, a very active member of our Natural Resources Committee who will introduce our speakers and moderate the Q&A session this evening. Cynthia, please come on in. Thank you so much, Martha. Good evening, everyone. It's my honor to serve as the moderator this evening for our League at Night on such an important topic and with such excellent speakers. Where and how we get our electricity is not well understood by laypersons. Don't we just flick a, a switch and it's on? I think that's the way certainly I have thought of it. Uh, in fact, it's a complex and technical subject full of unfamiliar terminology. And yet it is critically important to our quality of life, our economic vitality. And now we realize 
with some trepidation to our health and to the well being and very survival of our children and our grandchildren. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and climate scientists worldwide say that we must transition urgently from fossil fuels that emit dangerous greenhouse gases to carbon free energy in order to avert climate catastrophe. Back in 2017, the UN General Assembly President Maria Espinosa said that we have 11 years to make this transition. That's 2028. And then very recently, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Guterres, said, we are in a race for our lives and we are losing. So our speakers and their work, their responsibilities are extremely important. We're very fortunate to have such, such excellent qualified um, people here to speak to us on this topic. We asked them to address three questions. Number one, how do you see the path ahead in your work as utilities transition from fossil fuels? Number two, is it possible to accelerate progress on the path to renewable energy so that you can achieve 100% carbon-free energy supply to your customers by 2030 or another date? And number three, we ask them to address the role of distributed energy uh, sourcing. In other words, this is local rooftop solar. Um, how is this going to work in your strategic planning? Our speakers are extremely well qualified to answer these questions. I'll introduce the first speaker now. And when she's finished, I'll introduce the second speaker. Our first speaker is Rachel Wong. She is Director of Strategy, Research and Development at Sacramento Municipal Utility District. She's been at SMUD for 17 years. She was previously Director of Distributed Energy Strategy. Prior to that, she was at Procter & Gamble as a Senior Product Development Engineer. She holds a master's degree from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemical Engineering from Cornell University. Welcome, Rachel Wong, and now I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Cynthia. And, and I do wanna express my appreciation to uh, both Cynthia and Martha for inviting me to join you tonight for your discussion on how to get to 100% uh, renewable energy. As Cynthia mentioned, my role at SMUD is leading the development of the enterprise strategy for the intersection of our customer and our grid. So tonight, I'm really going to be focusing on the work that we're doing to partner with our customers to get to our goal of zero carbon emissions by 2030. Next slide, please. Um. So, uh, so first, who is SMUD? Um, you know, when I first moved to Sacramento, it seemed like a, a sort of an odd acronym, but we're the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, also known as SMUD. Uh, we're the electricity provider for uh, pretty much the Sacramento County with a sliver of Placer County, and we've been serving our community for over 70 years. <clears throat> like my fellow panelists tonight, um, SMUD is actually community owned and we're not for profit. So we're not an investor owned utility. Um, what that means is that we're guided by making decisions that are really in the best interest of our customers and community. And anything that we make, we reinvest back into our community. Um, unlike my fellow panelists, though, SMUD is actually not part of a city. So we uh, cover multiple jurisdictions, primarily within Sacramento County. We are governed by a seven member board of directors who are elected directly by our customers, and they establish policies and set our long term direction. In fact, they were instrumental in having SMUD lean in on our carbon emissions goal. They were the ones that declared a climate emergency in the summer of 2020 calling for a goal of net zero emissions by 2030. And then our CEO, Paul Lau, who took over in the fall of 2020, doubled down to make it absolute zero emissions by 2030 when he became CEO later that year. So we've been long at the forefront of tackling carbon emissions and our board has continued to encourage SMUD to think outside of the box, to find those creative solutions for cleaner, better community and region for where we live, work and play, as well as keeping rates low. Next slide, please. 
So it's actually not new for SMUD to lean in on our environmental goals. We've had a long history of leadership in this space. Um, back in 2010, we were the first utility in California to meet our 20% of our energy load through eligible renewable energy. We actually set our own portfolio standard before we were required to <clears throat> from a regulatory standpoint. Today, we're one of the cleanest utilities in the nation with over 50% carbon-free energy, where of that over 33% is renewable. Now we've developed our 2030 zero carbon plan to reach 100% zero carbon emissions in our power supply by 2030, which is one of the most ambitious goals of any large utility in the United States. And we're committed to do this while maintaining world-class reliability, keeping rate increases at or below inflation, and making sure that we're bringing along all of our customers as well as our community. Next slide, please. So there's multiple pillars that make up our plan, and it's important to note that this is a flexible pathway. With such an aggressive goal, we know how to get most of the way there, and I'll talk about that, but we're definitely going to need new technologies and business models to get us all the way to 100%. So I'm gonna go through each of these pillars, but I'm really gonna focus on um, where customers can really help us get to our goal. So first, we really need to work us on repurposing our natural gas generation. Um, based upon the analysis that we've done, we believe that we're going to be able to retire two of our peaker plants by the 2025 timeframe. This is going to be dependent upon some of our new technology and business models coming online, including some of these customer solutions I'll be talking about shortly. And just for perspective, what a peaker plant is, is, you know, as you think about generation plants, you've got ones that run more or less 24-7. But we recognize that, you know, customers have <clears throat> different energy needs during different times of the day. And in Sacramento, our peak energy use, so the, the time that people are using the most electricity in Sacramento is in the summer between 5 and 8 p.m. because they all come home and they crank up their air conditioners. And so, you know, we use some of these peaker plants not for the day-to-day -day electricity needs, but when we have that high demand of electricity. And so we often use them um, not that often, and they are often some of the most carbon-intensive uh, plants that we have. As for our natural gas power plant in our fleet, uh, Consumnus is actually our, our newest one. It's actually one of the most efficient in the state. So we're gonna be working to turn it from a baseload plant into a peaker plant, but also converting it into using clean fuels. And reliability is really, really critical for us. So as we're doing these transitions and exploring these different approaches, we're gonna be conducting more detailed reliability assessments before finalizing our plans for our natural gas power plants. Next, we are going to be adding a variety of renewable resources, including wind and geothermal, solar, but also a large amount of new local utility scale solar coupled with batteries. And we think that we can get about 90% of the way there with proven clean technologies, but we're really going to need to depend upon new technologies and business models to get us all the way there. That includes leveraging these distributed energy resources that I'm going to speak to shortly, as well as researching game-changing technologies like carbon capture, as well as long duration storage. And from a financial standpoint, I mentioned that we've made a commitment to keeping our rates within the rate of inflation. So we're gonna be looking at how we can do operational efficiency, as well as attract different grants and partnering with uh, different entities to be able to co-invest in this solution. And then finally, it's imperative to us that we execute upon this plan in an inclusive way that maximizes those benefits to our community. Next slide, please. So tonight we're talking about how to get to 100% renewables. And as I mentioned, we at SMUD believe that we can get about 90% of the way there to our zero carbon goals with proven clean technologies. And the reality is, is that we need a mix of both utility scale as well as customer scale renewable resources. And this is really to keep our electricity rates low. I mentioned about our financial goals, as well as to ensure that we, we do need resource diversity to help with reliability. From a utility scale standpoint, we do expect that we're going to need um, three and a half times our current amount of renewables and significantly higher amounts of battery storage in order to firm those renewables. From a customer resource standpoint, we plan to see rooftop solar and distributed batteries to expand substantially over this 10-year period, more than doubling to possibly tripling distributed solar over this 10-year period between 2020 and 2030. Coupling customer sited solar with battery storage is key as we move forward. The cost of battery storage has been relatively high, but it's definitely been coming down. We've seen a lot more adoption. And we're expecting to need anywhere between 10 times to 62 times our current amount of behind the meter battery storage to help us meet our goals. So you can see here in the pie charts, I've got one for 2020. I know the font is a little bit small, so apologies. You can see the pie chart for 2020 and actually how it changes to 2030. And really, we have this evolution of our power mix. And in the piece of the pie in that upper right hand 
corner that points that says new tech, you know, that is what I'm speaking about with regards to, we think we can get 90% of the way there, um, but we really need to depend upon that new technology for that last 10% to achieve our goals. And one other thing I'll point out since I've got some, some, um, some peers here that are gonna be speaking from the Southern California standpoint, since we're in Northern California, I do need to point out that our resource mix is different than other utilities. You can see the, the blue in both the 2020 and the 2030 standpoint. While large uh, hydro generation is not considered renewable, it is carbon free. And you know, in Northern California, we have access to low cost large hydropower, which um, is different than the situation in Southern California. Next slide, please. So what are we doing to partner with our customers to be part of the solution? Um, you know, we start by continuing our foundation of energy efficiency, but really we've been making a shift over the last few years to focus on their efforts where we reduce energy where it is most carbon intensive. So we've done great jobs with energy efficiency with things like lighting, but really, you know, reducing lighting load during the night isn't necessarily reducing carbon. So we're really focusing it on those things that are most carbon intensive, like energy on peak. So continuing to encourage more efficient as we think about air conditioning, for example. I saw in your 10 actions that cities can do to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions included after moving away from fossil fuels, um, electrifying buildings and vehicles. And we absolutely wholeheartedly agree. Even though electrifying isn't part of our own electric operations carbon footprint, we believe that tackling the low hanging fruit of emissions from buildings and transportation is key to benefiting our customers and community and helping both reduce greenhouse gas emissions locally, as well as frankly, helping from an air quality standpoint, which is a challenge within the Sacramento region. We have very aggressive goals relative to this. We're aiming to achieve 34% of our homes to be equivalent of all electric by 2030, and that 100% of new car sales in Sacramento will be electric by 2030. And that's about five years um, ahead of where Governor Newsom's goal is. What this means for us is offering a variety of programs to encourage customers to make the switch from gas end uses to electric, as not only does it enable our customers a way to help reduce emissions in our community, but in our service territory, <clears throat> if you look at our electricity rates, as well as the gas rates of our gas provider in our service territory, which is Pacific Gas and Electric, for the very large majority of our residential customers, their electricity bills actually go up less when they electrify their building end uses, then their gas bills go down. So um, they're actually saving that their electricity bills um, don't go up as much as they save on their, their gas bills. And from a transportation electrification standpoint, I'm sure many of you are seeing with the um, high gas prices, electricity um, is definitely a, a benefit from there. And as we go to zero carbon emissions, um, transportation that's electrified will truly be uh, zero emission vehicles. We do recognize that these investments will be substantial, especially as we wanna make sure that we bring all of our customers along. So we're working to partner with our regional entities, things like our uh, Sacramento Metro Air Quality Management District, who is also uh, supporting a lot of um, our electrification efforts, as well as seeking external funding to accelerate these efforts for our region. We see a lot of investment at both the state and the federal level, um, it, particularly in both building and transportation electrification coming down the pike. Next slide, please. So in addition to helping with energy supply through renewable generation like rooftop solar, a key part of how our customers can contribute to achieving our goal of zero carbon by 2030 is to actually partner with SMUD in how they use their electricity. So by doing so, um, if they're able to shift how they use their energy or if they're able to use it in a way that can help the grid, either to adopt more renewable energy. So for example, um, in California, we see an excess of solar generation in the spring before all those air conditioning loads uh, start up if customers are able to charge their electric vehicles at that time or uh, do that either at home or the workplace, that can be beneficial. Um, or reduce the investments that we need to make on the grid because you've got customers who are co-investing in these technologies and you're able to aggregate multiple ones to give us some flexibility versus having to invest in large capital investments of a, a plant by plant. Um, <clears throat> then we're gonna be able to share that value back to our customers. And leveraging customer resources can actually help us retire those two fossil fuel-based peaker plants I actually mentioned um, as part of our natural gas repurposing. The other thing too, is as we're co-investing in these things with our customers, we're able to keep that money local and, and, and continue to invest that money within our local economy. 
So how are we going to do this? Um, we're going to be offering a lot of new programs that seek to optimize our customers' energy use that balances both customer and grid needs to maximize the benefits for both while compensating customers for the value that they supply to the grid. We're gonna be testing out three different pilots or pilots in the following three areas. You know, first we're gonna be testing out pilots in load flexibility. We're gonna be sending communication to customers to shift their electricity use by increasing or decreasing their usage in response to grid needs. This can be done with or with it technology, which is important to us to make sure that everybody can participate. If you can better match your energy use with energy production, then we can integrate more renewable energy and reduce the need for gas powered plants. We'll also be piloting a couple of uh, virtual power plants, which we call VPPs, um, where we're gonna actually group many small devices at customers' homes and businesses. When you can operate and manage together all of these different technologies in a coordinated way, they can actually become an alternative to a conventional utility scale power plant. We'll first start by looking at solar and storage virtual power plants, but we're also going to be looking at virtual power plants that manage how electric vehicles charge, um, using smart thermostats uh, to potentially uh, reduce the electricity needed um, from air conditioning load during peak times and when you're on the fifth day of a heat storm, um, as well as electric water heaters, which can provide thermal energy storage to the mix as well. And so by aggregating the capacity of all these many devices, co-investing with our customers and um, being able to have the flexibility to mimic a power plant, it can potentially reduce the need for SMUD to build or buy other resources. Finally, grid to, finally vehicle to grid technology is a key area that we're looking at as well. So electric vehicle batteries can be connected to the grid to help stabilize the grid by either providing energy to the grid when lots of people are using energy or by taking a portion of renewable energy when there's excess available on the electric grid to charge the grid connected vehicle. We anticipate vehicle to grid advancements are gonna offer some of the benefits of stationary battery storage without the added investment of separate stationary battery storage. So as we think about all of our electrification goals, I mentioned the 100% of all new vehicles uh, sold in Sacramento to be 100% uh, electric vehicles by 2030. Um, those have batteries in those vehicles. And if we're able to tap into those resources, that can be um, a huge opportunity. So a lot of this is new um, and we're starting by launching pilots that run over the next few years. So we can learn from our experiences, testing their reliability, uh, their cost, as well as the value compared to alternative resources. The value proposition has to work for us and frankly, the value proposition has to work for customers to be able to think about, you know, whether they're willing to change that energy use behavior. This is going to inform how we operationalize the programs and the scale between the 2025 and 2030 timeframe, recognizing that we need to make a decision, I've circled 2024, about retiring that first peaker plant. Our goal is to develop a flexible plan where customers can bring a variety of devices that we use that can help reduce demand during key times of the year. So net, we want to partner with our customers to be part of the solution, both on the generation side, I talked about our distributed solar and, uh, dist and behind the meter storage, as well as changing their energy use in a way that provides the capacity that would displace some of our fossil fuel based plants in working to achieve our, our zero emission, our zero carbon, zero carbon emission goal. And so you can see on uh, the slide that I have 360 megawatts. That's where we feel like we need to make up. Um, with regards to the analysis on the plan. But if we're able to do this in a cost-effective manner, the way we've modeled it, it could be anywhere from 360 all the way up to 1400 megawatts. And with that, thank you. Rachel, thank you so much for that visionary and fascinating explanation of SMUD's plans. And I'm going to now transition to our next speaker, Nancy Sutley, and I'll introduce her. She is the Chief Sustainability Officer for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. She was the Chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality from 2009 to 2014. She's also served as Deputy Mayor of Los Angeles for Energy and Environment. She was Deputy Secretary for Policy and Intergovernment Intergovernmental Relations at the California EPA. She has a master's degree in public policy from the John F. Kennedy School at Harvard University 
and a bachelor's degree in government from Cornell. Nancy. Thank you very much uh, for having me here today. Um, so let me start uh, by explaining a little bit about the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, uh, which uh, is uh, your neighbor. Uh, so LADWP uh, serves water and electricity to the 4 million residents of the city of Los Angeles. And we're the nation's largest municipally owned utility and we're a department of the city of Los Angeles are uh, and we are governed by a five member uh, citizen commission appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the city council. And um, we have on the uh, uh, power side about 1.4 million uh, customers uh, serving the 4 million residents and on the water side about 800,000 water customers. So um, the other thing about LADWP, um, Again, like like our like my colleagues here on the panel, we are uh, publicly owned uh, and not regulated by the Public Utilities Commission. We are also LADWP is also uh, what's called a balance its own balancing authority, which means we operate our own grid. Uh, we generate electricity, we transmit it and distribute it um, throughout the city of Los Angeles. And uh, because of this, we have a footprint that actually exceeds uh, outside of the city boundaries of the city of Los Angeles, uh, up uh, throughout other parts of California and actually into uh, five Western states. So we have a pretty big uh, footprint. And even just a few years ago, um, LADWP looked, I think, like a fairly typical uh, electric utility in the US. Uh, where we are largely dependent on fossil fuels to generate power. Um, and we, we have begun the transition and we're making great progress in the transition uh, to 100% uh, renewable energy. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, this study that was completed about a year ago that helps uh, kind of illuminate how we're gonna get there, really gives us a roadmap about how to get 100% green energy. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? So let me talk a little bit about some of our uh, recent successes on uh, around clean energy. Um, we have done a lot over the last uh, couple of decades to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and we are well ahead of schedule uh, to get to the state's 2030 goals. And we've cut our greenhouse gas emissions by more than half. Um, we have been, uh, I think, it's actually over the last eight of the last nine years, Los Angeles has been ranked the number one uh, solar city uh, in the United States. In fact, the uh, the latest rankings just came out um, the other day, and we were very pleased to uh, to see ourselves back at the top. Um, we've done a number of things in terms of adding renewable energy into our portfolio, uh, having recently completed a number of projects, including. Uh, projects like our Beacon plant uh, near Mojave, California, uh, which also includes uh, battery storage. Um, we have under construction now the largest solar plus battery system in the country, uh, not too far away from a Beacon called Eland. And just uh, a few months ago, uh, we saw the uh, commencement of a commercial operation of uh, the, we think is the largest uh, wind uh, project in the US uh, and we are the largest uh, off taker. So we're the largest customer for that uh, wind project. It's lo located in New Mexico uh, called uh, Red Cloud. And we've also made uh, significant investments in uh, expanding electric vehicle infrastructure. So I think this slide is a little out of date. We're at about uh, 17,000 electric vehicle chargers within the city of Los Angeles that are either um, shared public chargers uh, or otherwise available to in, in commercial buildings. So not counting uh, what you might have in your garage. Uh, and that um, supports a large, um, we, we have the most electric vehicles registered in the city of Los Angeles uh, anywhere in the country. And we've also been able to, through our investments in energy 
uh, efficiency, achieve a 15% energy cumulative energy savings uh, at the end of 2020 and versus our 2010 baseline, and we continue to make those investments. Can you go to the next slide, please? So we feel uh, pretty good about where we've uh, come from, and we needed to find out where we're going. So in 2016, uh, the LA City Council asked LADWP to uh, undertake a project to understand what investments would be necessary for LADWP uh, to make to reach 100% clean energy. And they really asked um, a number of very important questions around the pathways to get to 100% renewable electricity supply um, while looking at what the impact would be on the end uses of electricity and also ensuring that we could continue to provide the high degree of reliability, that is the high degree of knowing that uh, when you turn, when you uh, flip the switch, the lights will come on. They also wanted us to look at what the environmental benefits and the public health benefits. And as Rachel noted, it's not just um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but Los Angeles unfortunately still has the distinction of being of having the worst air quality in the United States. And while our power plants don't contribute very much to the regional smog, it's mostly coming from cars and trucks and buses and from the ports of LA and Long Beach and all of the freight movement associated with them. And through electrification, uh, we can help to reduce uh, the pollution burden uh, across our communities. They also wanted to know what would happen in terms of uh, jobs and the economy. And then finally, make to ensure uh, that uh, all of our communities within Los Angeles uh, benefit from this transition uh, to, to clean energy and that we really address um, the issue of environmental justice or the environmental injustices of our, our, our current uh, energy uh, uh, structure. So if you go to the next slide, please. So we, uh, as I said, we, we contracted with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, a part of the Department of Energy. Uh, and we also engaged with our community. So we had a stakeholder advisory group uh, that met over about a three year period uh, to help really shape the analysis uh, and, to, uh, and to be able to share priorities that uh, the priorities of the people of Los Angeles and make sure that that was reflected in the, in the study itself uh, and in terms of the kinds of results we, we might see. So that study was completed uh, last March and it, it came to a number of very important conclusions. Uh, the first one was that we can achieve 100% renewable energy in the city of Los Angeles over multiple pathways. In other words, they literally looked at thousands of scenarios and modeled uh, LA's energy system really down to the building level and concluded that there were many ways that we could get to 100% clean energy. Now, the state's goal in statute is to get to have the utilities get to 100% clean energy by 2045. Uh, one of the scenarios that the National Renewable Energy Laboratory looked at as part of the LA 100 study was whether that could be done by 2035. And they did conclude that it was feasible to get to 100% clean energy by 2035. So uh, our city council and our mayor um, said, well, that looks pretty good to us. Uh, so that's the goal uh, that we are working towards now to get uh, LADWP, the nation's largest municipally owned utility to 100% clean energy by 2035. And importantly, they also looked at what, what this would cost. Um, so they did identify that this would require a significant investment uh, in really literally rebuilding our electric system, our electric grid uh, in Los Angeles. 
And that was likely to require investments in the 50 to $80 billion range over uh, the next three decades. But they also noted that there would be significant green job creation as a result of all of this investment. And another thing that they noted was that the rate impact, so it's one thing to have the utility costs, but how that is, um, how it translates into the bills that you pay through our electric rates is, is a sort of complex process. Um, but they noted that the rate impacts, so the rate increases that we could expect to see as a result of all this investment would tra track inflation if we see a high levels of building and transportation electrification. I think for some of the reasons that Rachel noted, which is there's more electricity sold to uh, spread the costs over in, in addition to the significant environmental benefits from a greenhouse gas and an air quality perspective. And that in the study, they also noted that we couldn't achieve any of this without there being significant growth in our customer facing programs. So rooftop solar, uh, battery storage at the customer on the customer's own site, a demand response and energy efficiency program, and, and the adoption uh, of electric vehicles. And you may be aware that uh, the state of California, uh, Governor Newsom issued an executive order uh, to uh, end the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles by, uh, by 2035. So all of that uh, will have an impact on LADWP. Can we go to the next slide, please? So get into a little bit of the numbers. So as I said, they looked at literally thousands of scenarios and across all of these scenarios, they noted that there would be significant growth in all of these areas, in electrification of both buildings and vehicles that we needed to really uh, expand uh, our use of energy efficiency, and that we needed to uh, invest in things that provide uh, flexible load. In other words, that you can sort of time when you, uh, when you have load, uh, so it all doesn't come on at once. Uh, as they said, is when people come home and flip on their air conditioning, but really to try to uh, use technology to um, to help to manage that. Um, very significant investments in customer rooftop solar. Um, so we, along with other utilities in the state of California, uh, we, uh, through the uh, Million Solar Roofs Program, offered um, incentives for people uh, to install solar panels on their roof. Um, now that the incentive part has uh, sunsetted, uh, but we pay people uh, for the energy that they provide to the grid from the solar systems uh, at their at their home or their building. Um, we have another program called uh, Feed-in Tariff, uh, where it's we're basically signing a contract uh, with a solar provider uh, within the city of Los Angeles. Um, uh, think about some of the warehouses down uh, down at the port uh, where they can cover the uh, rooftop with panels and they can sell that electricity directly to us, um, as well as a community solar um, program that allows people access uh, to solar uh, who may not have a roof. So if they live in an apartment building. I'd also noted uh, significant increases in the amount of solar energy and wind energy. And I mentioned a couple of the projects that have come on recently, uh, and we, uh, like our friends in Pasadena, are members of the Southern California Public Power Authority, uh, which is a, a joint powers authority of, of the um, number of cities in Southern California. Uh, we work together to procure renewable energy uh, for our customers. Uh, we'll see a very large increase in storage, uh, both in batteries, uh, and other forms of storage. Uh, so for example, LADWP has a hydro pump storage facility, uh, which you know, lets us take advantage of, of, of the changes in demand over the day uh, up at the Pyramid uh, Lake, uh, sorry, Lake Castaic, uh, up on the five, uh, just before you get to the grapevine. 
um, we have to make significant investments in our transmission and distribution um, system. And also uh, looking at um, the kind of capacity, how do we mimic the kind of um, capacity and energy we get out of our natural gas-fired power plants in the LA Basin, we have four of them, um, without burning fossil fuels. Uh, so looking at renewable derived fuels like green hydrogen uh, as a way to uh, uh, have that kind of uh, capability that we that we have today. And today we use that daily. Uh, in the future, uh, we expect that that will be uh, very infrequently, um, but it's necessary. And go to the next slide, please. Uh, we also uh, still uh, have an interest in one uh, coal plant located in Utah. Um, it is scheduled to uh, cease operations in 2025. And initially, the idea was to replace it with a, a smaller um, natural gas fired power plant in the same location uh, because we already have uh, the transmission uh, to bring the power from Utah into Southern California. Um, but a few years ago, we started working on this project um, to really make this a, uh, a, a very uh, important center of renewable energy. So there are wind projects, geothermal and solar, all coming that all can come into uh, in the Intermountain Power Plant area. Uh, there are uh, salt caverns underneath uh, that we could store green hydrogen that can be made from the renewable en energy through a process uh, called electrolysis, which is basically, I'm not an engineer, breaking apart uh, molecules to, to sort of free up the hydrogen and we can store it on site. So that's what we're working on right now. Um, in 2025, the coal plant will shut down. Uh, the gas plant will uh, uh, commence operation and uh, initially have the capability to run about 30% hydrogen and sometime in the 2030s to convert to run on 100% um, green hydrogen. So next, next slide, please. So um, this is, sorry if this is a little bit of an eye chart, um, but we are really kind of moving forward uh, full speed ahead uh, to get uh, our plans in place to reach our now 2035 goal uh, to get to 100% clean energy. So we completed the LA100 study. Um, it identified the kinds of investments that were necessary. And so we've undertaken two follow-on uh, studies that will be very important in, in determining sort of our actual uh, plans. And one is around equity. Um, and our, our board and our, our mayor and our council are very uh, committed to ensuring that uh, all of all Angelinos uh, benefit from this transition to 100% clean energy uh, and really uh, have a focus on equity. And, and what that means uh, for LADWP is around uh, improving air quality and ensuring that everyone in Los Angeles has access to solar energy, that our energy efficiency programs reach all of our residents and businesses and all of the other um, sort of customer programs uh, that both help our customers save money and reduce their environmental burden, uh, including um, access to electric vehicle uh, charging. And then of course, importantly, looking uh, at rates, uh, so the rate the rates that we charge for for electricity, and also um, impacts on our total the total bill that somebody uh, will pay. And then the last piece is this uh, 2022 SLTRP, which um, stands for Strategic Long Term Resource Plan, and it's really that is really the roadmap. Uh, and so those scenarios are being developed right now, uh, looking at actually, you know, what goes where, when, uh, to ensure that we can meet our 100% our uh, clean energy target. And I think that's it for me. So thank you again for having me and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Nancy. 
that is you're like you're on a pioneering expedition doing all these amazing things. Uh, both you and Rachel described your work as um, new technologies, new business models. It's really very exciting. Uh, what I want to know is how do you pronounce SLTRP if you want to use it as an acronym? Uh, we haven't we haven't Slurping. figured that one out yet. It's it's pretty <laughs> awful, but uh, there's a long and not very interesting story of how we got to that. Later, so you can tell us suggestions. Slurped. Okay, thank you so much. Let's move on to Robert. Uh, Robert Castro, let me introduce our own Pasadena person. Uh, Robert is the Power Systems Resources Manager, as many of you probably know, the local people. He's been with uh, PWP for a relatively short time. I remember talking with him when he first came on in May of last year. But before that, he has many, many years of experience at LADWP as an electrical engineer from 1988 to 2021. He's also taught power engineering systems at USC over um, the course of, looks like a couple of decades. Thank you so much, Robert. We look forward to hearing from you. My pleasure. Um, again, my name is Robert Castro. I am the resource planning manager for Pasadena. And we're going to talk today about the path to carbon neutrality. Next slide, please. So Pasadena is taking a proactive and multifaceted approach to addressing climate change issues. And so this presentation will address the Intermountain Power Plant divestment, our progress on the renewable portfolio standard and greenhouse gas reduction, electrification, both of buildings and electric vehicles and other continuing efforts. Next slide. Let me begin by talking about some of the compliance mandates that Pasadena and other utilities need to adhere to. The Renewable Portfolio Standard is mandated by the California Energy Commission. Uh, California Air Resources Board, or CARB, uh, mandates the emissions for greenhouse gases. And the California Independent System Operator, or CAISO, uh, gives us certain reliability requirements. And we're going to focus a lot on that reliability aspect um, going forward in this presentation. Next slide. So CAISO is a balancing authority that encompasses most of California. You can see the tan on this uh, slide here, and that represents the entirety of the CAISO balancing authority. Now CAISO requires all of its participants to meet firm capacity requirements known as system resource adequacy. So Pasadena is required to have an equivalent of 115% of its total max load available whenever CAISO requires it. So there's a requirement that Pasadena be able to supply firm capacity within five minutes when requested by CAISO. Next slide, please. Uh, Pasadena has made significant progress towards its renewable portfolio standard goals. You'll see the black line indicates the state mandate for RPS and the green bars demonstrate that Pasadena consistently over the last decade has exceeded its uh, renewable portfolio uh, requirements. Next slide, please. We also note that um, the greenhouse gas reduction is a very important component of, of our efforts. Matter of fact, we recognize that lowering greenhouse gas emissions is the primary driver for higher RPS goals. And if you look at the graph, the top black line of the graph indicates the uh, requirements that Pasadena needs to meet. And if you look at the blue and green lines below that, you'll see those are the emissions that Pasadena has um, done. And there's a significant difference between the mandated reductions that were supposed to have and those emissions that we have had, this is primarily due to Pasadena's pro, uh, proactive efforts in energy efficiency. 
So we note on the green and blue graph that those greenhouse gas emissions fall dramatically after Pasadena withdraws from the Intermountain Power Plant in 2027. And that brings us down to about 90% of greenhouse gas reduction by 2030 as compared to the 1990 baseline levels. Next slide, please. Pasadena is also interested in promoting electrification, um, both in uh, construction as well as in electric vehicles. And we see here the carrot approach where Pasadena has numerous incentives, both to residential customers and its commercial customers. Next slide, please. Now we also have passed an ordinance this month that is more of a, a stick approach in that we require electrification in lieu of natural gas for some aspects of new construction, including new multifamily residential buildings greater than three units, as well as existing commercial buildings with substantial expansion of its footprint, um, say 50% or more. Next slide, please. Uh, but that's only half the electrification efforts. Uh, as mentioned previously, electric vehicles, or I'm sorry, non-electric vehicles, provide a substantial amount of greenhouse gas emissions. And we see that Pasadena per capita has one of the highest uh, adoption rates of electric vehicles as exemplified on this graph, where the 2010 emis um, ownership is pretty much de minimis. And by the, the end of the decade, it starts to make a, a significant impact. Next slide, please. Now we find, we try to lead by example. And Pasadena recognizes that a big concern for potential electric vehicle owners is to have a sufficient amount of charging stations nearby to power their devices. And so Pasadena has embarked on the installation of a number of charging stations in Pasadena, and those are delineated in the chart on this slide. Next slide, please. Uh, again, we like to walk the walk, and by leading by example, Pasadena has embarked on a zero emission fleet strategy for its city vehicles. And so they've adopted a three-year fleet replacement plan that aligns very well with CARB's guidelines uh, for market development strategy. Next slide, please. Pasadena is also embarking on a number of pilot projects to investigate those new technologies that are needed to go from the 90% um, greenhouse gas reduction level that we'll be reaching by 2030 and to get that last 10% that would require the development of new technologies. So as part of that effort, Pasadena is involved with a pilot project with the California Institute of Technology. And so in collaboration with Caltech, Pasadena plans to deploy a number of distributed battery storage systems onto existing distribution circuits. So this pilot project is an alternative to the norm of upgrading a city block worth of poles, conductors, and transformers. And by taking this approach to mitigate the voltage problems extant on a number of distribution circuits, we can potentially save 80% on traditional utility solutions for this mitigation effort. Next slide, please. And so Pasadena believes in uh, partnering with stakeholders and its ratepayers in moving forward. And towards that end, Pasadena has already kicked off its 2023 integrated resource plan effort. And that's reflected on the website delineated on this slide. And on this website, we have an invitation for a number of, of members or, or anybody who'd like to sign up for consideration for the stakeholder advisory group. In addition, there's also an invitation on that website for ratepayers to um, complete a customer survey and again, that information will be used to help us decide and seek input on a partnership going forward to meet our renewable goals 
and plans. Next slide, please. So to summarize, Pasadena is continuing its efforts uh, towards a 0% or a net zero carbon uh, as soon as possible. Part of that is we're divesting of the Intermountain Power Plant by 2027. That'll get us around to a 90% greenhouse gas reduction again by 2030. And like other folks mentioned, the last 10% is, is gonna depend on technological advancements. And we're also in that realm. And towards that end, we're gonna be investing in electrification efforts. We're also going to be securing more renewable capacity and energy. We're also going to seek um, outreach from our um, ratepayers as well as stakeholder inclusion. We're going to be securing more energy storage. And all of these efforts will be to ensure a reliable and clean energy system with a minimization of impact on our ratepayers. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to thank you for your attention. And besides all the questions that we'll be fielding at this event, I did want to give you my um, email. So if there's other events that come up, we do take, or other questions that come up, we do take this very seriously. I would like you to contact me and let me know of some of your concerns so we could integrate your concerns as much as possible into our next integrated resource plan. Thank you so much, Robert. So we now have a long list of questions from participants and I will start working my way through them. Um, please, the panelists should come, should unmute. Good, I see Rachel and I see Nancy and Robert, you should put your um, screen back on, please. So the first question, well, the first question is directed to SMUD, but I'm gonna generalize it. The question is, when is SMUD going to reduce their high fixed monthly fee to expand rooftop solar? And I'm generalizing that to sort of a question for Pasadena and maybe LA also. What can you do to make it easier? for customers to actually you know, invest and, and use and implement rooftop solar. There are a number of uh, jurisdictions where there are fees. There's a lot of discussion about getting rid of or changing net energy metering, uh, creating grid fees, grid access fees and this sort of thing. So what are you doing? Let's start with SMUD. What are you doing to reduce what this person is saying is a high fixed monthly fee to expand rooftop solar. And then maybe the other speakers could talk, for example, in Pasadena, I think there's a some kind of 5% limit on net energy metering. Um, yeah. So, so, so thank you for the question, very much appreciate it. And if I, if I think what the fixed fee is, I'm gonna answer the question based on what I think it is, but if I've got it incorrect, you know, please let me know, is that um, SMUD actually has a fixed monthly fee as part of its electric service. And we've actually had that for, for several years. It used to be um, that $5 for, for many, many years, and then it started escalating. And so, um, and, and really what I would say is um, the reason why we put together that fixed monthly fee to begin with and why it's escalated over time, we actually escalated it as part of our transition from uh, what we called tiered rates. So, um, we used to have rates which were volumetric, right? So if you used a certain amount of electricity, it was at one price. If you used more electricity, it was a higher price and it was supposed to send an energy efficiency message and an energy efficiency price signal. So then we recognize as, as we're making this transition to more renewable energy, you know, the generation is not, um, it's not just baseload generation from, from natural gas power plants, but it's variable because you've got renewable energy. So you're generating a lot during this, during, you know, when it's sunny outside, you're generating a lot when it's windy. And so um, one of the things we realized is, is that we really need to start moving towards a time of use rate. So um, there are certain times when electricity is more expensive for us to provide. And there's times when it's less expensive for us to provide. And so therefore we made a transition away from what we called our volumetric rates to our time of use rates. And we are continuing to innovate um, 
not only with our standard rate uh, frameworks, but also for pilot rates to work with programs that are optional opt-in uh, to send more price signals to encourage customers to use their energy in different ways. And I kind of talked about that in my presentation. So we talked about load flexibility and virtual power plants. The fixed monthly fee, like I said, started escalating <clears throat> as we made that switch to time of use rates for, for another reason. One is we recognize that as um, there's as, as we look at our balance of how much of our costs are fixed costs versus variable costs, we saw that a very large percentage of our costs are actually fixed costs. You know, it's a very, it's like 70, 30 or, or, or you know, so, so as such, that was part of the rationale behind putting down, uh, putting together that, that fixed cost and why that fixed cost has been escalating. As it relates to the question about encouraging solar, you know, um, another thing I talked about in my presentation, I think Nancy touched upon it as well, is as we think about moving towards this zero carbon future and 100% renewables or 100% carbon free, we really need to be pairing um, solar with battery storage. And so what we've been doing is making a shift of you know, we recognize it's valuable when customers can pair their rooftop solar with battery storage. So we've designed some new pilot programs that I mentioned with our virtual power plants, where we're actually offering um, upfront incentives that are high for customers to adopt battery storage, whether they have solar now and can adopt battery storage, if they're adopting it as a package moving forward. And there's sort of two parts. There's one, which is that upfront incentive to help bring down the, the initial cost. But then there's also what's those ongoing incentives. We have two programs. One is where we actually have a critical peak price rate, which means, you know, when the grid needs it the most, we will um, pay you the most if you can help us from a resource standpoint. So we can, if you let us dispatch your battery in those situations, then we'll give you the most value for that. So we've got one program for battery storage in that standpoint, and that's with other technologies as well, managing your EV charging, doing your air conditioning. And then the other one is a solar and storage virtual power plant, as I mentioned. And in that model, we're paying an even higher upfront incentive, but we're also going to pay a capacity payment. So if you let us dispatch your battery even more when we need it from a utility standpoint, we will be giving you payments for that. And, and like I said, these are pilots, so we're continuing to um, experiment with the value proposition, but it really speaks to the direction that we're trying to go in the context of what we've been talking about tonight is how do we get to that 100%? Well, we need to make sure that we have that reliability and that we have the resources to serve our customers' energy demand. And in order to do so, that's why we're making a movement towards pairing our solar with, with more batteries. And you're trying different things. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nancy, do you have something to say about how you get customers to join in and and how do you avoid creating um, uh, charges and other burdens on customers who wish to be yeah. solar generators? Well, uh, so far that hasn't been so much of an issue in LA, um, but you know I think this is it's an important issue in sort of how how we uh, properly sort of price, all of this is, is going to be really important going forward. But I would just note for Los Angeles, you know, 60% of our residents are renters. So we want to make sure two things. One, they have access to clean energy. And so through things like uh, our community solar um, program um, and, you know, a number of other things, we want to make sure that our renters have access to clean energy. But we also want to make sure that we're not um, shifting costs onto uh, those renters. And I think this is a complicated question that California is going to have to grapple with at some point. Um, as you may be aware, the uh, Public Utilities Commission was looking at this and they sort of said, uh, we don't know. Uh, Oops. <laughs> so, uh, so I think there's a there's a lot um, that you know we as a as a as communities and as a state have to kind of address to make sure that we're capturing, you know, the benefits uh, of solar to to everyone. Uh, we are we are properly compensating the people who, uh, you know, sell electricity back into the grid. Uh, and that we are, are um, ensuring access for, for all of our residents to the benefits of clean energy. Robert, what do you think about distributed energy and generation in Pasadena and how it can be more encouraged? No, well, it is a more important component um, as time goes on. 
it used to be that utility scale solar was uh, 10 times cheaper than rooftop solar. Now that's been cut in half where it's maybe five times more expensive to install a rooftop solar. But you know, there's other benefits to having rooftop solar locally. It does improve local air quality. It does uh, provide additional engagement with customers. So we're pivoting towards um, you know, the welcoming of more rooftop solar. But again, there's, as Nancy mentioned, it is sort of a, an equity issue and amount of dollars. So for example, let's say I can spend money and take a diesel vehicle off the road. If I can spend the same money and take a diesel truck off the road, a, you know, a semi, that would make more sense in terms of bang for our ratepayer buck. And that's kind of the position we're currently in is the utility scale solar is much cheaper compared to the solar of residential. And what Pasadena has done already is we've invested so much in energy efficiency that we've lowered our load by 20%. And so that's a, a, a huge achievement. But what that means now is there's less load to spread the costs over. And so we wanna make sure that the costs are allocated correctly. That for example, if we give incentives for a rooftop solar, that is not going to negatively impact a renter to subsidize that. So um, it is getting easier because rooftop solar is becoming more widespread. And as it becomes more widespread, the costs come down. And we are kind of all in the same boat where we'd like to get to 100% as soon as possible. And rooftop solar is an important component of that. And it's growing in import as time goes on. Thank you. I have one follow-up from um, someone. Uh, this person is saying, Robert, when you compare the price of rooftop solar to utility scale solar, are you including the cost of transmission? Yes, and, and actually we just did a study um, on that in the last two months. And we found out that not only is the delivered dollar per megawatt hour, um, you know, five times more expensive for a, a, a rooftop, but also a utility scale solar project which is sited at a prime insulation level, say in the Mojave Desert, that also has maybe single axis tracking, provides about 70% more energy. So on a couple of different metrics, it helps. But again, I don't wanna belittle rooftop solar. Uh, we think it's a, a very important component. One, it also shows a commitment in Pasadena for um, clean energy. If we build a plant way out in Palm Springs or something, it's not as evident that the commitment Pasadena has towards clean energy or greenhouse gas reduction. For example, the energy efficiency efforts I mentioned about reducing our load by over 20% is a, a, a very large achievement, but it doesn't have that visual bang that a rooftop solar has um, that kind of gets the whole community involved in the, you know, the race to a zero carbon uh, net zero. And that's kind of an mm -hmm. important component that we're trying to incorporate into our uh, development going forward. Okay. Um, I have a question here. Would each speaker please identify the current percentage of renewable energy in their energy portfolio? Certainly we're at, uh, 40% right now. Pasadena is currently at 40%. One of my slides showed that, but I, I happen to know we're at 40% right now. Is that 2021? 2021 is 40%, yes. Yeah, yeah I think we're, we're, we're about the same, uh, about 40%. Um, and with some additional um, zero carbon resources that don't count towards the uh, state's renewable portfolio standard. Yes, and I was frantically looking it up <laughs> as, as, as I saw the question because I our integrated resources person, so our Robert um, equivalent would be the best person to ask. But, uh, you know, for 2020, our 
filing with the California Energy Commission was 34%, according to, as Nancy mentioned, RPS eligible renewables, but we were over 60% carbon free because I mentioned we have the the hydro. large hydro. Mm-hmm. Right? Interesting difference. Boy, we have so many good questions here. Um, someone just asked, are you doing any pilot programs for electrifying current buildings by converting natural gas heating systems to variable speed heat pump systems. And I would add to that question, pilot programs for municipal uh, buildings. Are you doing any pilot programs for publicly owned buildings as well? So we uh, are about to launch a um, program called no offense to engineers, we never should let an engineer's name programs called the Comprehensive Affordable Multifamily Retrofit Program, CAMERA. Ah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's a, a it's sort of a, a soup to nuts, I guess, uh, energy efficiency program aimed at affordable multifamily housing, um, of which there's a lot in Los Angeles. And that will include, can include, uh, electrification uh, of the of the building. So, um, you know, California has adopted some building codes that in- encourage electrification of new buildings. Um, and I think uh, the city of Los Angeles on the municipal buildings, I, I we don't really handle the municipal buildings, um, but uh, the city of LA uh, joined with a, a, a number of other cities across the country um, and the Biden administration's um, building decarbonization efforts. And I'm, I'm sure we're all involved in a number of different efforts around building decarbonization. But it's a really important uh, thing because so much of the energy use in our cities is really in our buildings. Oh. I can oh. chime in. We, yeah, yeah. we, uh, we, we actually recognized that we needed to start making a shift in our strategy uh, for energy efficiency actually towards more uh, beneficial electrification when we started our DER strategy actually back in 2015. And so we launched um, some pretty comprehensive building electrification incentives for residential starting in 2018. And then we tried to start um, offering some for commercial customers as well in the late 2019, early 2020. And so while we had them available in 2020, uh, I don't think we got a lot of takers on the commercial side. It was a little bit slow given uh, given COVID, but we we do have uh, incentives available both for residential and commercial, and we lump our our, our multifamily into into commercial uh, for buildings, recognizing the importance of that that building decarbonization that Nancy mentioned. In Pasadena, okay. we came mm-hmm. across a similar problem <laughs> Rachel just alluded to, where we are providing incentives for both residential and commercial customers. So that's focused primarily on existing customers. And then we also adopted a stick approach by um, adopting new ordinance for new buildings and uh, multi-level houses earlier this month. Uh, I anticipate that those new um, ordinances mandating electrification will be extended to smaller dwellings but um, don't want to promise anything since we're being recorded. Uh, That's not <laughs> <but> so. <laughs> existing buildings are, are a different animal. It is you know, more difficult to retrofit a building than to do new buildings. And so um, having this ordinance uh, addressing new buildings coupled with the incentives for existing buildings is kind of the tack we're taking right now. You know, Philadelphia retrofitted their mun- their uh, big museum of art. Uh, it's really quite an ambitious project and I'm hoping that somehow our library will, <laughs> will have something like that. When they, uh, when they retrofitted it, did they have a modern art sign on all the pipes? <laughs> uh, I don't know, that would be cool. Okay. Um, okay, Robert, here's a question for you from someone I know is a JPL engineer. So he's asking a hard question. He says, are there major reasons that PWP could not pursue the greenhouse gas reduction timeline goals of LIDWP? I think, I think he also means um, the um, energy source t- 
timeline goals of LADWP and SMUD, which are more ambitious than the state mandates. And, and I did want to address it by, you know, there's two components to the, and I'm glad this question came up because again, I kind of want to brag about Pasadena's efforts. You could either get more renewable generation to meet those RPS goals, or you could lower your load to get those same goals. So they're, you know, not one is better than the other, but Pasadena has done a remarkable job of lowering its uh, loads by 20%, so that by 2027, um, we'll be close to 90% reduction um, compared to that baseline. Now, I, I think the other utilities are, are doing great work and, and uh, um, I'm not sure if they're that 90% level, but I think we're all in agreement that that last 10% is going to depend on new technologies. And, and since my the question is a JPL engineer, <laughs> I'll mention that a, a one of the projects that was mentioned for Intermountain Power Plant repowering was using green hydrogen in the combustion turbines. Right now, combustion turbines can only be 30% by 2025 uh, use of green hydrogen. And for that facility to be 100% uh, renewable, the combustion turbines would need to handle 100% green hydrogen. And so that's one example of an area where we need that technological drive. One other area that uh, Rachel had mentioned is battery storage. Currently battery storage only goes about four hours. And so the firm capacity value of that battery starts to dwindle. We need eight hour battery storage, which keeps that firm capacity throughout the timeline of study. And that's flow batteries a, a new developing technology that's not really commercial yet. So we're at 90% by 2027, which is pretty good, but that last 10%, all the literature I've read, we're gonna need another um, new technologies to help get to that final point in a um, cost efficient and effective manner. Robert, just following up on that, you're saying Pasadena is going to lower the loads but isn't it also true that Pasadena is going to have more and more demand for electricity because of EV charging? That's so, you know, I, I don't know if it's oh, no, that's efficiency. A good point. We've been asking people to be efficient for a long time. How are we going to lower the loads? No, no, the loads have already been done since 2018. We've lowered our load by 20%. And so we've done this proactively um, lowering of our loads. And, and that part's done. And that's why our, our graph on greenhouse gas, there's such a big gap between what the mandate is and what our emission levels are. Now, the uh, electric vehicles you're mentioning, we're anticipating 70 megawatts by 2045. And don't forget those, uh, as time goes on, that load increases will be primarily renewable. So as we're, we got rid of uh, our, and we did our energy efficiency efforts when the we only had to have 20% renewable. Our load will be growing, and by 2030, it'll be 60%, and that'll continue to grow. So what's nice is we're adding load as our renewable RPS standards are higher. Since it's recorded, you can play it back. <laughs> yeah, no, I... Um... I am looking for a really interesting question that a person asked about geothermal and firm energy. Um, here it is. We are hearing news about excitement and new interest in geothermal, especially around the Salton Sea that has no downtime. Shouldn't geothermal be increased enormously? It also leads to mineral gathering like lithium and other valuable materials. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I would, uh, well, I would say, first of all, we do, um, LADWP does have geothermal in its portfolio and have, and have for a number of years. Um, so we like geothermal because it is, as, as the uh, question um, did, uh, firm, it's there all the time. 
Um, the problem uh, with expanding geothermal is actually the, the transmission. Uh, so getting the power from the geothermal resource to uh, into the load centers in Southern California. Um, so uh, the salt and sea, um, LADWP has been looking at that for a long time. We actually have a little bit of, of geothermal there already, uh, but we don't have a way to get the power into LA. Into LA. Um, and it's, it's, it's very difficult to build new uh, high voltage, long distance uh, transmission lines. And, and the, I think the difference between, for example, solar and wind, you know, there's a lot more places where the wind blows or the sun shines and we have space to put in the, um, you know, the solar uh, uh, panels or, or the wind turbines. Geothermal is in very specific locations. So that, that has been, I think, that challenge. Um, and because we own our, uh, operate our own transmission system, we try to use our own transmission lines because otherwise we have to pay the California independent system operator to access their transmission lines and it, and it, it potentially makes geothermal uh, way too expensive, uh, which is which is unfortunate. So, you know, we're hopeful that, you know, some of the investment coming from the federal government as a result of the Infrastructure and Jobs Act um, can help to expand um, that high voltage transmission capacity throughout the West and, and potentially allow us to access more of that geothermal uh, energy. But uh, LA spent a bunch of time, Robert may remember this, uh, pursuing a, a transmission line from, uh, from the Salton Sea area into Los Angeles and it kind of went nowhere. Any other comments on geothermal? We're actually at the end of our time. For Q and A, but I don't want to give. I want to give people a chance to say anything else on this topic or anything else, really. Okay, um, we have at least looks like about thirty really great questions. So we're going to put them together and you know and and keep them, and maybe you'll have time to respond, uh, or maybe we'll continue this discussion. I would like to say before I transfer to my colleague Kathy Berlin that this conversation actually gives me a lot of hope. The three of you are so interesting and expert. And I know it sounds like there's a lot of open questions, but the thing is you're on that path and you're trying all sorts of different things. And I can sense the commitment that you have to get us to this goal of 100% carbon free energy. Thank you so much for your expertise and for your time. And I am now, let's switch off your, uh, your mics, please, and your screens. And I'm going to transfer now to Kathy Berlin from the League of Women Voters, Pasadena, who's going to talk about our advocacy projects. Hello. Um, the National League of Women Voters Climate Action Team reviewed numerous climate action plans and found them aspirational. Sorry, I got interrupted. Um, has found them aspirational, but not focused on real actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We found, however, that cities and local governments are taking action by other means, reach codes, ordinances, and et cetera. So we created this list of the most important actions that cities and governments can take to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, as you can see, they fall into three categories in order. Um, the first being our discussion tonight, the transition from fossil fuels to carbon-free sources of energy. Uh, the second is to electrify buildings, and the third is the electrification of vehicles. Next slide, please. Our advocacy is around these issues and these actions. They're not issues, they're actions, excuse me. We encourage you to join us in our advocacy. Um, we have formed two coalitions. Um, the first is the Pasadena 100 Coalition, which is to encourage the transition to 100% carbon-free power sourcing. Um, some might remember that there was a coalition of the same name when Pasadena was um, updating its um, integrated resource plan, IRP, which is the plan for 
power sourcing in Pasadena for the future. Um, and that had been done. And now Pasadena is updating their plan again. And so we are again forming a coalition to um, advocate for 100% carbon free power. We've also formed um, a coalition, the Building Electrification Coalition. And these two, co which is obvious in its um, goal, these two coalitions have met with the city staff, the city council, the Environmental Advisory uh, Commission to express our requests to them, but also to share our research with them. And they have been very receptive um, for the work that we have shared with them and the information. For instance, there are 56 cities in Pasadena that have some form of building electrification um, codes, reach codes or ordinances or what have you. Um, so, the other thing that we do is we send action alerts when these climate issues, um, these climate mitigation issues are um, being considered by the city. We provide the information on how to, how to join the city council or um, whatever city meeting it is, how to join it, how to uh, send written comments and how to speak at, at those meetings. Um, we have found that if one or two of us speak up, um, it is easy for the city to ignore us. But if we speak up in tens and twenties and thirties of us, um, they have begun to listen and to know that the public is watching and concerned about these issues that affect us all. So please join us. If you send an email to the um, email address on the scene to action alert NRC community at lwb-pa.org, we will, um, there is a form and you can fill out your information and we will contact you when these issues are being considered by the city council. And again, if you will join us, the more of us that care about this and speak out, um, it only takes a few minutes really to send a written comment for sure. Um, the more of us that, that speak out, the more likely these uh, goals are going to be met as soon as possible. Next slide, please. This is climate action, democracy in action. That is what we are doing. We are all about democracy in action. Um, we, the action is for the climate emergency for the city to meet the demands of the climate emergency that we are all experiencing. So please join us in speaking up. Um, if you are interested in joining the coalitions, there will be a space for you to comment on that as well when you send your email. And now our president, Martha Zavala, will bring this to a close. Martha. Thank you very much. And Kathy, where did you get my picture? <laughs> I think I was uh, the third one from the left there in that picture that came out before. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you, Nancy, Rachel, and Robert. My God, thank you for the discussion on getting that path to 100% renewable energy. I, we know that the job that you do is very difficult. People come up with ideas, but these power plants that you work with take years to come online. That's one of the reasons why we feel this sense of urgency that any future steps you're taking, they really, really have to double down on efforts to get off these um, systems because you're stuck with brick and mortar, uh, things that have to be built in order to um, actually generate that power. So I think that's why we feel that anxiety. We know that it takes time for you to turn the Titanic around. We really appreciate that you really dedicated yourselves. I can see how much experience you have that you've been working at this for a long time. When I hear some of you about your plans that are you know, already, um, 10 years old or whatever that you're working with. And we ask today for you to make some changes to some plans and things that have been put in effect for a long time. But we really feel that that is what's necessary. And, you know, God bless you for uh, the work that you put in. Thank you very much for coming to speak with us. We really, really appreciate it. Um, you know, I was kind of uh, surprised to hear about uh, personal electric vehicle batteries being um, part of the solution. And I hadn't heard about electrolysis, I think since high school or something, high school chemistry, to kind of split the water molecule. So 
Um, that was that was interesting. You all have uh, really great presentations, and um, I think the clar clarity with which you speak is really helpful for our audience. But um, I know that you know we we really want to focus on results, and and that this is one of the ways that we know how to do it is um, informing the public and asking asking them to take action. Uh, Cynthia, thank you for moderating today's event. Uh, you did a great job, and thank you to the um, for the advocacy um, opportunity, uh, Kathy Berlin. Uh, I really appreciate uh, that you worked behind the scenes also on the Q&A, so thank you very much. And uh, dear audience, I think Cynthia mentioned, if we didn't get to your question, uh, feel free to send any uh, lingering questions via email to the events um, at L events at lwv-pa.org and we'll work to get you an answer. And also remember that the video is gonna be available in a couple of days so you can come to our website and go to our YouTube channel to pick it up and let all your family and friends and family know that they can get excited about climate action and that there's more to learn and more to know about the changes they have to make too you know, because this impacts us all. So, uh, you know, it's really great to see what government can do when they put their minds to it because the solutions are there. I think we heard that, you know, they, LA City did the analysis and, uh, you know, it took them a long time to do it. You hear a three year study to determine that those goals could be met. But uh, I know they're aggressive goals and really um, a lot of work uh, needing to be done. So one of the things that I don't want you to forget is that we do have monthly programs. The next one is on Cinco de Mayo. We're going to have a really great program about things that are concerning all of us in uh, the social, uh, excuse me, um, you know, social justice arena. We have the largest sheriff's department in the country and it's troubled right now, you know, and it may be that this is built up over years and years of, of, you know, um, ingrained, ingrained culture. And so we're gonna hear from Mr. Uh, Max Huntsman, the Inspector General for LA County on Cinco de Mayo. The other great thing about Cinco de Mayo is you will be able to go to the registrar recorders link or to ours to get more information about the primary election that's coming up. Uh, we all have to show up en masse because remember the fewer people that show up to vote, the bigger the, the weight of their vote and everybody else is left out of the picture. And you won't have a say as to who shows up in the election in November. So you have to show up at the primary election, but come to our website um, on Cinco de Mayo and we'll have more information available for you. So, um, we hope to see you then. Uh, please register for the event. And thank you again to the public officials for attending, to Nancy, Rachel, and Robert for sharing your knowledge and commitment to leading the move to renewable power sources. Um, and finally, to our Zoom hosts, Catherine and Hester, thank you very much uh, for the work that you do. And thank you, our wonderful audience, for sharing your evening with us. Thanks a lot.